Uh, so welcome to stage, Julian from Irantis, and take it away. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julian Hennig. I'm coming from Irantis, working there as a pre-sales principal solutions architect. Um, and today, we will talk about uh, hosted control planes and how to leverage it for digital sovereignty um, and how it helps to uh, do Kubernetes things more easily, efficient, and innovative. Uh, a quick question to you guys uh, who heard about hosted control planes before. Oh, just one hand, two hands. Um, then I don't need to ask who's using it, so um, good. Let's start. Um, so what we see is a rising demand, of course, of Kubernetes. Um, people are, or developers are also using Kubernetes nowadays in their pipelines to test, for example, Helm charts, to test different um, applications also on different Kubernetes versions because um, what we see here is a mix or chaos of different Kubernetes distributions that are out there. And of course, that this makes things complicated and complex. So there's the need for multi-cluster management, multi-cluster uh, deployments, and um, this often creates operational burden. Because an EKS cluster, for example, looks completely different to uh, a vanilla Kubernetes cluster or a Rancher Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift or other Kubernetes distributions out there. Um, and also they have different Kubernetes versions themselves. So this, of course, makes things very, very uh, hard for people to manage, especially when it's about security, when it's about compliance, also monitoring and alerting. So you need to, uh, as a corporate, normally want to have a look into uh, your environments and what people are doing. Doing that with uh, different regions or in different regions with different Kubernetes versions can be hard. So there's no consistency really across um, the world uh, in a corporate business normally. Um, hyperscalers, for example, already have an approach of hosted control planes. So um, if you, for example, create an EKS cluster, it's just a control plane that you create, and after that, you um, just attach worker nodes, for example, to it. So the hyperscaler already, uh, hyperscalers are already doing that, and um, what we now see is that the easiness of creating those control planes should also move to private clouds, should also move into data centers, and should also benefit not only in one hyperscaler, but perhaps also in different hyperscalers. So there's the concept of hosted control planes. And hosted control planes are nothing else than a control plane running as Kubernetes workload. We see the same concepts already, uh, for example, with different open stack versions where people or distributions um, use that for their benefit. So they put con the control plane of OpenStack or other components of OpenStack into Kubernetes and benefit from self-healing capabilities or um, uh, high availability, for example, too. And with hosted control planes in Kubernetes, you just put um, the control plane inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, in this case, it is called management cluster. Others say mothership cluster. So it's very different, but um, you have the management cluster where you run your control plane and expose it via a service. And the service can be, um, depending on your environment, can be a load balancer, can be a node port, or can be any other service. In the best case, or this example, for example, with vanilla Kubernetes is not possible because um, there are a couple of components that are needed. Those components um, do shrink the uh, port um, resources or port open ports between worker nodes and control plane nodes. Um, normally the control plane has like the Kubernetes A API open have for example different ports open for ETCD or others. Um, this is not needed 
when we are talking about the modern way of doing hosted control planes. So normally you would run the control plane in um, virtual machines, bare metal, or somewhere else. In our case, we run it as Kubernetes workloads and pods. So it's just a Kubernetes control plane or controller node that is running in a pod. It completely decouples the worker nodes um, and the control brain. So this also gives a lot of uh, security possibilities or security um, uh, benefits because you can isolate those much better and have a control centrally in your management cluster about things. It gives flexibility because um, when we're talking about Kubernetes and talking about running a control plane as a workload, you can also run the data store very differently to uh, the way you've run uh, your data store at the moment, like stacked ETCD, for example, or other options in external ETCD for the cluster state store. Directly inside of a Kubernetes cluster, you can use volumes. You can also use, um, together with Kine, for example, PostgreSQL or other databases you would like to use. And I've already mentioned that, so the self-healing capabilities of Kubernetes are definitely helping us to keep the control plane up and running. And um, you don't have or need to have the high availability in all the different stages, so control plane, load balancer, and data store. You can think about what makes the most sense for your environments. And again, control plane and uh, the cluster itself becomes a bit, becomes again a bit more cattle. Before that, um, of course, it's pets and um, some people are still running Kubernetes version uh, 1.16 because it needs to run their application. That's not the way Kubernetes was designed. It was designed to be cattle, it was designed to be on demand and there when we need it, but not there when we don't need it. So um, there's a combination that I will show you today. Um, there are other vendors that are doing the same approach. Um, in our case with Mirantis, we have two open source projects called K0S and Cosmotron that we will show today. And there's the project um, Cluster API. So now again, the question, who of you heard about Cluster API? A bit more hands. Who's using it? One, two, uh, okay. So um, then we'll just jump very quickly uh, of an overview of Cluster API. So Cluster API is a sub-project or community-driven project by the Kubernetes community. It helps to uh, do cluster and resource provisioning in different clouds, and it's the uh, heart of a multi-cluster solution. In some cases, already uh, different uh, Kubernetes vendors are using cluster API under the hood, but don't talk to, uh, about it too much. Um, it also helps with cluster upgrades, updates, and essentially consists of three different uh, providers or three different components. Uh, those components I will talk about on the next slide too. Um, and cluster API is already becoming, becoming very mature and also has a lot of other different benefits like um, the cluster class or cluster resource set. So you can specify your cluster in a YAML file, again, decorative APIs in a YAML file and specify also the ecosystem you want to deploy or add-ons you want to deploy in your Kubernetes cluster too. Let's say you have a pipeline where you want to test something and you also want to have directly uh, perhaps a specific set of applications together deployed, like a database that you prefer that's possible with cluster resource sets or a CNI or a CSI, uh, everything possible and packaged together within the YAML file, the big YAML file. So this offers us a lot of automation and infrastructure as code, but also uh, for Kubernetes lifecycle management. I've mentioned the three um, providers. We have infrastructure provider, we have the bootstrap provider, and the in, uh, control plane provider. 
And the list is just an example that you see there. So of course, infrastructure provider list is already very big. Uh, you can find almost any infrastructure provider you can think of um, already uh, in the list of cluster API. And there's Bootstrap and um, the uh, control plane provider. And those two help with the uh, one uh, to bring up the control plane, to create certificates, to uh, just create the control plane uh, manifest. And the bootstrap, which is helping to uh, spin up the nodes and deploy everything that is needed inside of that node. You can use KubeADM. There are others too, um, like Cosmotron and K0S, for example, and that's where we will now dive very quickly into. So K0S is a lightweight Kubernetes distribution. Um, it is pure Kubernetes, so we are using pure upstream open source Kubernetes and do a bit different things with it. So we package it, everything together in a single binary, which gives a lot of benefits because it's one service that you can run on a node, on a Linux node, for example, and have all the different things already included like EDCD can be included. You can create agap bundles as well, packaged together with a binary, which simplifies cluster operations very much. So it's easy to use, secure by default, because it's not depending on any um, services that are running already on the node. It just, it's just the single binary that includes everything. And batteries included, but swappable. So we are include a CNI, for example, we also include different other options like Kine and connectivity, Kine I've already mentioned. Connectivity is something that uh, we'll have a look into too. And for lifecycle management, there are different uh, options here. So you can use just a binary, you can use a CLI, and you can use an operator. A Kubernetes operator is nothing else as a service that can handle custom resource definitions in Kubernetes. That's where Cosmotron comes into the play. So Cosmotron uh, itself, um, as is without cluster API, is a control plane manager. So it can handle the uh, control plane creation and can help with the uh, uh, provisioning of a control plane. Together with cluster API, it offers us the hosted control plane option because we can have a control plane running in management cluster somewhere, for example, in AWS, and I can create worker nodes somewhere else because uh, we have connectivity, which shrinks the size of or the amount of pods that need to be opened, and uh, we have kind for the data store in the background. So it really simplifies it and makes yeah, Kubernetes control planes manageable directly inside of Kubernetes. There are a lot of different use cases we currently see and um, are very beneficial. If you want to do everything GitOps on a GitOps space, uh, that's possible. So you can create YAML files for your clusters and um, have, for example, also edge computing use cases. So create, um, in most cases, when we talk about edge computing, the resource amount directly at the edge is very limited. And you have network constraints, for example. In those cases, um, having the control plane, not in that picture, having the control plane running somewhere where resources are available helps a lot with, um, with bringing Kubernetes also to the edge. And of course, multi-tenancy and multi-cloud scenarios. I've already mentioned AWS and for example, OpenStack. Uh, so you can have a mix of different Kubernetes uh, or different infrastructure providers where you run your Kubernetes clusters. Just as reference, so when we have, or when we are talking about uh, the limited amount of ports that need to be opened, between worker nodes and control plane, the control plane, there are just two ports that we need. The Kubernetes API, of course, the Kubernetes API needs to be exposed anyways, otherwise you would not get access to your cluster. And we have this um, project called Connectivity Agent. 
Again, it's an open source project. Everyone can use it. It's not bound to K0S or Cosmotron. Um, it also is in use by others, um, but it helps to uh, make, for example, those edge use cases much, much simpler. Because at the end, it's just uh, one connection between the connectivity server and the agent, where you can have all the different connections between worker nodes and the control plane bundled in one encrypted um, communication or one encrypted channel. And of course, this gives a lot of different benefits. As you can see, you can do almost anything directly through connectivity and through the Kubernetes API, even on the nodes. So you can exit uh, to directly to the node and get access to your uh, access to your, to that node, even if it's at the edge. So bringing all together um, for hosted control plane, that's just uh, um, a simple diagram. Of course, it can be uh, can be much more complex. But as you can see, uh, we have the control plane running in pods. Um, it is using volumes for the cluster data uh, or cluster state store. And we have a service that is exposing the Kubernetes API and connectivity agent or server. Control, uh, the Cosmotron controller handles all the K0S control planes. And the two other components that we see here is the cluster API controller, which is the heart of the solution which is like the root object or the root uh, um, controller. And we have the infrastructure controller. And the infrastructure and controller in this case is handling all the communication to your infrastructure, no matter if it's OpenStack, AWS, or other um, hyperscalers or providers like vSphere as well. So um, it will talk to those APIs and create nodes in those infrastructures and connect them through the bootstrap provider again to um, our main uh, control plane or the Kubernetes cluster that we've created. Think about it as option also for creating tenants because in most cases you want to have different projects running in different clusters, you want different teams running in different clusters, so there is the possibility now to create simple tenants and also split the, um, let's say, operational uh, border. Because if one team is doing all the stuff related to the management cluster, creating control planes, etc., there can be another team that is um, responsible for the infrastructure where the Kubernetes workload should run or the application should run. So what has, does that has to do with digital sovereignty? Of course, what is digital sovereignty? Um, it's developing independently and of course also self-determined. Um, independence and self-determination is nowadays very crucial and important. You don't want to be a, or rely just on one single vendor. You don't want to rely on just one single, um, single infrastructure provider or hyperscaler. So you want to be able to create clusters perhaps easily on different hyperscalers at the same time or even worker nodes from the same cluster at the same time and have um, your workloads running redundant in those two hyperscalers. So if one fails or one, for example, changes pricing, you can switch to the other one. So it's very simple to be uh, self-determined here with this approach. Compliance security, of course, is also very important. Um, so when we talk about isolation, about having the same versions or having a look into your security vulnerabilities in different Kubernetes clusters, this approach is definitely helping. And upgrades and updates can be made centrally. So you just need to upgrade the control plane and the worker nodes uh, will be either recreated or upgraded as you would like it to do. And from a technical point of view, of course, reduced resource footprint. You don't have to run uh, your control plane in virtual machines or on bare metal, for example. You can have uh, run them directly in your management cluster in pods with a much lower footprint than before. Consistency across uh, environments. And of course, I've already mentioned that uh, you have the same approach, for example, for SREs to create control planes or create Kubernetes clusters, this of course simplifies things also. 
and operational boundaries. That's something I've mentioned. So um, let's jump into a very quick demo. It's uh, really very, very simple. I don't want to uh, um, over complicate it here. Um, so what we uh, currently uh, see is Kubernetes becoming the operating system, the open operating system of the cloud, because it is almost running every service. No matter if it's running uh, directly OpenStack and you have the uh, ability to uh, create virtual machines, or you run KubeVirt, for example. So it's, it's offering a lot of different options here. So my demo, I will just create a very simple control plane. Um, by doing that, well, with Lens, I will show you what I'm doing here because it's much simpler to just use kubectl. So you will see that we can create control planes very easily. <clears throat> so at the moment, um, when we have a look into the parts of the cluster I have here, I've specified already the namespaces we want to see. So the cluster API system, Capo, which, uh, which is the um, uh, cluster API OpenStack provider, and we have Cosmotron. And the three different providers I've also mentioned, it's an infrastructure provider, a control plane provider, and the bootstrap provider. Cluster API is the heart of the system, so that means if you create a cluster, it also um, manages all the different communication to other controllers. And we have the uh, Carvo controller, which is the infrastructure controller that talks to the OpenStack cluster. Now, when we uh, create a control plane, we want to, uh, as mentioned, keep it simple. So that's why I've just created a very, very simple control plane YAML. And a simple one. And as you can see, it's just um, a custom resource definition that describes a cluster. And this cluster object will be deployed in the namespace Sweden. We have one replica. We can specify here the version, for example, of the control plane. We can specify the service that should expose this control plane or the Kubernetes API and the connectivity port. And of course, we can use a different persistence level. In this case, I want to make it simple again. So we just use MTD. So within seconds, I can just create a control plane. So now, Cosmotron looks for the custom resource definitions and sees this control plane uh, object and creates all the needed resources for it. In combination with um, cluster API, this also includes all the infrastructure components uh, that are needed in the other uh, infrastructure provider. So uh, let's have a look into your uh, just the namespace, and we can see we have a stateful set that has just one replica. We have um, one service that exposes the Kubernetes API and the connectivity pod, and we have one pod that is running the Kubernetes API. You can also just quickly have a look into uh, um, the logs. So as we can see, it's doing the same things as a normal Cube ADM cluster, for example, does. Um, so creating the control plane, spinning up different services, creating certifi uh, certificates, and other things here too. So it really simplifies the operations. And if I now want to, for example, change the Kubernetes version and upgrade the cluster, it's just changing the YAML file to a different version, and Cosmotron will handle all the rest. So that was it. Uh, feel free to have a look into the projects, have a look into Cluster API too. So uh, it gets a lot more traction at the moment and, uh, and any contribution is welcome.
Thank you very much. Any questions for Julian? Julian? Julia, Julia. Julian. Yeah, Julian. Yes. So I see a lot of similarities with uh, Gardner. Mm -hmm. uh, what are like the key differences or the key benefits of, of using this project uh, over Gardner? Um, so there are differences, especially in the um, um, packages that being um, deployed, for example, into your, um, the uh, control plane or as the control plane. So Gardner, for example, has a different approach of deploying the control plane inside of a Kubernetes cluster. So um, a KZRS is really uh, like simple, small, and lightweight, and it's pure Kubernetes. So it's, it's really, um, if you want to do feature flags, for example, or change feature flags of Kubernetes, if you want to do any um, customization, it's very, very simple. With Gardner, it's sometimes a bit more complicated and it's not that lightweight. So as you probably saw, the control plane is currently running 0 0.1 CPUs and a bit of memory. So it's a bit of, um, it's, it's the same approach or a similar approach with the hosted control planes, but um, definitely a different approach from a Kubernetes point of view. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? I would like to throw this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can throw it to me and see if I can catch it. Good, but then uh, thank you, Julian. And next on stage, um, yeah, you can do applause, absolutely. Thank you.